The account was duly receipted in the ledger, and Dr. Hardy was about to leave, when suddenly he turned and, handing me some of the banknotes just received, said to my surprise and thankfulness, By the by, Taylor, you might as well take these notes. I have no change, but can give you the balance next week. Again I was left, my feelings undiscovered, to go back to my little closet and praise the Lord with a joyful heart that, after all, I might go to China. The year 1852-1853 With the impatience of an idealistic 19-year-old, Hudson wrote his sister a letter in March of 1852 in which he said, I feel I have not long to stay in this country now. I do not know what turn Providence is about to take, but I think some change is coming, and I am forewarned that I should be prepared. Pray for me that my faith shall not fail. Hudson saw no likely prospect for any immediate service with a missionary agency. They all required ordination and more training than he had. So he began to think of saving enough money to pay his own way to China. He would just trust God for provision once he was there but even the thought of working to save up money for his own passage seemed an unacceptable and frustrating delay. So he began considering yet another alternative which he raised in the same letter to his sister. If I stay here another two years and save fifty or sixty pounds to pay my expenses to China, I shall land there no better off than I go if I go at once and work my passage out. In two years there will die in that land at least twenty-four million people. In six or eight months I should be able to talk a little Chinese, and if I could instruct in the truths of the gospel one poor sinner, then what would the hardship of a four or five months voyage weigh in comparison? Hudson hoped to find a berth as an assistant to a ship surgeon. If that wasn't possible, he'd go as a sailor. Though he was more than willing to endure the hardship which that would entail, the advice and prayers of family and friends convinced him that he had more to learn before he had set for the other side of the world. Dr. Hardy offered Hudson a medical apprenticeship, but his plan required a commitment that would last several years. And as eager as Hudson was to become a doctor, he felt he needed to be ready to go to China as soon as the opportunity opened up. So he turned down that kind doctor's offer. Shortly following, just months after his 20th birthday, Hudson decided to continue his medical studies in London. He felt certain that after a short time there, the way would open up for him to go to China. And he wasn't nearly as concerned about needing more money, more education, or even more maturity as he was about continuing to exercise and strengthen his faith. I felt I could not go to China without having still further developed and tested my power to rest upon his faithfulness, and a marked opportunity for doing so was providentially afforded me. My dear father had offered to bear all the expenses of my stay in London. I knew, however, that owing to recent losses it would mean a considerable sacrifice for him to undertake this just when it seemed necessary for me to go forward. I had recently become acquainted with the committee of the Chinese Evangelization Society. Not knowing of my father's proposition, the committee also kindly offered to bear my expense while in London. While these proposals were first made to me, I was not quite clear as to what I ought to do, and in writing to my father and the secretaries, told them that I would take a few days to pray about the matter before deciding any course of action. I mentioned to my father that I had had this offer from the society and told the secretaries also of his proffered aid. Subsequently, while waiting upon God in prayer for guidance, it became clear to my mind that I could without difficulty decline both offers. The secretaries of the society would not know that I had cast myself wholly on God for supplies, and my father would conclude that I had accepted the other offer. I therefore wrote, declining both, and felt that without anyone having either care or anxiety on my account, I was simply in the hands of God, and that he who knew my heart, if he wished to encourage me to go to China, would bless my effort to depend upon him alone at home. Hudson did accept the Mission Society offer to cover his fees at the London Hospital where he studied, 
and an uncle in Soho gave him a place to stay for a few weeks until he could find permanent lodging. But beyond that, Hudson Taylor, a small town boy, was on his own in the hustle and bustle of London. Before leaving Hall, he had written to his mother, I am indeed proving the truth of that word, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. My mind is quiet, as much at rest, and nay, more than it would be if I had had a hundred pounds in my pocket. May he keep me ever thus, simply depending on him for every blessing, temporal as well as spiritual. About his search for a job that would pay living expenses and leave time for his studies, he wrote to his sister, Amelia, No situation has turned up in London that will suit me, but I'm not concerned about it, as he is the same yesterday and today and forever. His love is unfailing, his word unchangeable, his power ever the same. Therefore the heart that trusts him is kept in perfect peace. I know he tries me only to increase my faith, and that is all in love. Well, if he is glorified, I am content. Hudson decided that if his faith was going to fail him, better to make that discovery in London than in China. So he continued his test, living on his meager savings and God's provision. He wrote at this time, To lessen expenses, I shared a room with a cousin four miles from the hospital, providing my own board, and after various experiments, I found that the most economical way was to live almost exclusively on brown bread and water. Thus, I was able to make the means that God gave me last longer and as much as possible. Some of my expenses I could not diminish, but my board was largely in my control. A large two-penny loaf of brown bread, purchased daily on my long walk from the hospital, furnished me with a supper and breakfast, and on this diet, with a few apples for lunch, I managed to walk eight or nine miles a day, besides being a good deal on foot, attending to the practice of the hospital. The following months further tested Hudson's patience. Even as he studied, he prayed for an open door to China. During that time, he almost died of a fever contracted from a cadaver he and fellow students worked on at the hospital. But events were transpiring on the other side of the world that promised to change the course of Chinese history and suddenly made Hudson Taylor's long-time dream an immediate reality. In China, the Taiping Rebellion looked to be on the verge of success. Its capital, firmly established at Nanking, its nominally Christian forces had swept over the central and northern provinces. Peking itself looked almost within their grasp. Hung Chua Tuan, founder of the Taiping movement, had read a Christian tract that had been impressed with Christian teaching. He wrote to an American missionary, Send me teachers, many teachers, to help in making known the truth. Hereafter, when my enterprise is successfully terminated, I will disseminate the doctrine throughout the whole empire, that all may return to the one Lord and worship the true God only. This is what my heart earnestly desires. Suddenly, it seemed to the waiting Western world that China, closed for centuries to foreigners, was about to be thrown open to messengers of Christianity. The entire Christian church in Europe and North America grew excited at the prospect. It seemed an opportunity too wonderful to miss. Money began pouring in to the treasures of mission organizations for China-related projects. For example, the British and Foreign Bible Society decided to undertake an unprecedented printing of one million copies of the Chinese New Testament and the society paying Hudson's school expense decided to send two men to Shanghai as soon as possible. One of these men, a Scottish physician, couldn't leave immediately. But they thought Hudson Taylor, single and only 21, might go on short notice, even if it meant sacrificing the degrees he was pursuing in medicine and surgery. Despite his past impatience, the decision wasn't an easy one for Hudson. He had had enough dealings with the Chinese Evangelization Society to realize some of what it would mean to be accountable to its organization. He would need their approval for anything he did in China. They wanted to send him to Shanghai. But what happened if, he, if the way opened for him to move into the interior? 
he began to feel that God was calling him to inland China where no Western missionary had ever gone. And now with the seeming success of the Taiping Rebellion, the opportunity might be there. He began to wonder whether or not he would be better off returning to his earlier plan of going to China on his own, dependent on and accountable only to God. He asked his friends and family for counsel and prayer in his decision. But after an interview with one of the secretaries of the society, he wrote to his mother, Mr. Bird has removed most of the difficulties I have been feeling, and I think it will be well to comply with his suggestion and at once propose myself to the committee. I shall await your answer, however, and rely upon your prayers. If I should be accepted to go at once, would you advise me to come home before sailing? I long to be with you once more, and I know you would naturally wish to see me. But I almost think it would be easier for us not to meet than having to meet and part again forever. No, not forever. I cannot write more, but hope to see and hear from you as soon as possible. Pray much for me. It is easy to talk of leaving all for Christ, but when it comes to the proof, it is only as we stand complete in Him can we go through with it. God be with you, and bless you, my own dear mother, and give you so to realize the preciousness of Jesus that you may wish for nothing but to know Him. And to his sister he wrote, Pray for me, dear Amelia, that he who has promised to meet all our need may be with me in this painful, though long-expected hour. The decision was soon made. Hudson Taylor was going to China, and he booked passage on the first ship he could find. Moored at her landing in a Liverpool dock, the double-masted sailing ship, the Dumfries, was bound for China. A small vessel of 470 tons, she was carrying only one passenger, so there was no crowd to see her off. Mr. Pierce, a representative of the Mission Society, and Hudson's father had made the trip to Liverpool. But when needed repairs delayed the ship's departure, they both had to return home, leaving only Hudson's mother to actually see him off. He later recalled the difficulty of that exciting and sad experience. On the 19th of September, 1853, a little service was held in the stern cabin of the Dumfries, which had been secured for me by the Chinese Evangelization Society, under whose auspices I was going to China. My beloved, now sainted mother, had come over to Liverpool to see me off. Never shall I forget that day, nor how she went with me into the cabin that was to be my home for nearly six months. With a mother's loving hand she smoothed the little bed. She sat by my side and joined in the last hymn we would sing together before parting. We knelt down and she prayed, the last mother's prayer I was to hear before leaving for China. Then notice was given that we must separate, and we had to say goodbye, never expecting to meet on earth again. For my sake she restrained her feelings as much as possible. We parted and she went ashore, giving me her blessing. I stood alone on deck, and she followed the ship as we moved toward the dock gates. As we passed through the gates and the separation really commenced, never shall I forget the cry of anguish wrung from that mother's heart. It went through me like a knife. I never knew so fully until then what God so loved the world meant. And I'm quite sure my precious mother learned more of the love of God for the perishing in that one hour than in all her life before. As difficult and emotional as that parting must have been, the trials of Hudson's around-the-world journey had just begun. It was a journey nearly doomed before the little ship even reached the open sea. For twelve stormy days, the Dumfries beat about St. George's Channel in gale-force winds, alternately sighting Ireland and the dangerous Welsh coast. Hudson's journals tell the story. All day on September the 24th, the barometer kept falling, and as darkness came on, the wind began to freshen. The sailors had a hard night of it, so the captain did not call them aft as is his custom to read prayers on Sunday morning. At noon it was blowing hard, and we took in all possible sail, leaving only just as much as would keep the ship steady. I distributed tracts among the crew and then came down to my cabin as the increased motion was making me sick. 